Thank you for clicking on the video. Here today, we're finishing up with the calibration series of videos. Uh, I actually filmed this intro after I did the actual bulk of the content. So we were able to kind of get everything done in this video here today and not break it up into a third video. So uh, today we're doing brightness, contrast, gonna talk a little bit about color, some other settings on your projector or TV, focus sharpness, all that sort of stuff to kind of finish up with the calibration settings on your TV or your projector. Like I said in the other videos, I'm not an expert. I'm just an enthusiast and somebody who enjoys this hobby of home theater. And we're using the AVS HD 709 disc, uh, mainly because that's free. You can either watch the videos here on YouTube and kind of stream them to your TV or projector if you don't want to burn them to a disc or download them to a USB drive. Uh, or you could do that and actually get a hard physical copy to use of this. So that's why we're using that uh, calibration disc here today. And we are using my D-Vision 30 projector. Uh, you will still see the RGB uh, kind of lines going up and down, but I found that projector worked out a little bit better for what we're doing here today. So with that, I think I got all the initial information out of the way and we will do the little channel intro and then we'll go right into finalizing the calibration. Again, this is a video that's gonna be kind of like a live stream style video with minimal editing. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. And if you have any comments or questions you want answered, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. And maybe I'll do a final follow-up video answering any questions that anyone has over the calibration process and I can pass along whatever information you know I have. But with that, let's get on to the actual calibration video here today. So like I said in the intro, we're gonna do the calibration stuff for these projectors with the AVSHD uh, BT709 disc. And that's because this disc is free to download. Uh, you can download it, burn it yourself. Um, you can look, check out my video about calibration just if you want to do that. Uh, you could also just use these patterns on YouTube if you don't want to burn a disc. I have the playlist linked below uh, in my description of the video here and there's also a playlist on my channel uh, and there's a few other ones around YouTube that use these exact patterns on here. And you could also download the files directly uh, if you really wanted to, um, you know, download the file, open them and just make them into like a MP4 video and play them on a computer or put them on a USB drive. But that's the reason we're using the AVS HD disc. Uh, you could use Spears and Munsell or the Digital Video Essentials or like a THX certified disc or something or Disney Wow, whatever. Those will all get you to the same place we're gonna go with this disc. Uh, but those just will have slightly different, like the stylings of the patterns and stuff are gonna slightly be different. And then those discs typically will have demonstration material where we don't really have any of that here uh, on this disc. Uh, one other thing I will point out, I'm gonna walk over here. If you download this disc, you won't find this on the YouTube version, but if you download the disc, uh, as either just a computer file, you know, to put on a USB, or you actually burn it to a disc. This HDTV calibration actually runs through all the steps that I talk about here in these videos, uh, but they're using a TV. You could actually watch those as well, uh, and they'll kind of explain similar things here. So that is another positive aspect uh, to having this AVS HD file, you know, downloaded and either burnt to a disc or, you know, just on a USB. Anyways, enough of that. Let's talk about what we're doing today. So, as I said in the intro in the title of this video, we're doing the just the basic calibration for brightness and contrast, and maybe into a few other things, depending how long this video runs and how far we get. Uh, I'm also going to give another heads up. I know I mentioned this in the intro. When we get to the <laughs> um, brightness calibration, which basically sets your black level, I'm going to kind of hop out of this camera angle and go into a super close-up 
And I'm just going to warn you guys that footage is probably not going to be the most pleasing footage to look at. It's going to be pretty grainy because I have to really mess with the ISO and shutter settings and stuff to really get those bars to appear on my camera, on my camera phone. So for the few minutes we talk about that, that footage may not look too pleasing. Uh, so I want to give you guys just a heads up in advance, but everything else we do should still be bright enough and I should be able to pick it up with the uh, camera that we're using uh, in this position here with my phone. So we're doing the basic settings. First things first, though, let's talk about some settings on the projector that you want to kind of take care of or look at before you hop into the actual calibration for brightness and contrast, because a lot of these settings are going to play with each other and interact and cause things to change uh, across the board, depending on how these other settings are, are kind of set up. So we're going to go into the menu system. I am using my D-Vision projector, my D-Vision 30. Uh, I did a little A-B testing and the D-Vision, despite the fact that you're probably still seeing some of the RGB color wheel lines sliding, you know, up and down uh, on the screen, it actually produced a little bit easier image to see with my phone <laughs> to do this. So that's why I'm doing it. But in, in this menu and on all projectors, and this will go for TVs as well, especially modern TVs, you want to go into the menu and go to picture setting on this version, you know, on this projector. Uh, most projectors and TVs will have a picture setting or it may say uh, like advanced or options. Uh, so some of these kind of factors will be in different spots, you know, depending on how the TV is manufactured. But some of the big things you want to do first, uh, the aspect ratio is a big one, which will come into effect uh, a little bit later on in the calibration, but I'll kind of mention it here. Most TVs and most projectors, and I'm going to walk in front of the camera here, and I have the lights off, so you may see me a little bit. You may not. You may just see my lovely uh, outline here in the shadow. Most TVs, most projectors, whatever, are going to have aspect ratio settings. And we'll get into this, like I said, a little bit down the road. I wish the menu would stay up longer on this projector. Anyways. You always want to find the aspect ratio that says one to one or direct or pixel to pixel. Uh, I'm trying to think what else, what other names I've seen. Uh, but it's something like that. You want to find the one that's going to do one to one. Because even like this fill aspect ratio, fill 16.9, these may look correct, but that's because this is a 16.9 image. If you were to put a different aspect ratio, you know, 4.3 or something on there, it's going to look like this. It's going to be kind of weird. So you want to have it as, well, even this one, you can see letterbox. This blows everything up as a zoom factor, and you can tell it's like cropping things out. So you don't want that. The one you want is one-to-one. -one. That means it will give you a one-to-one -one or pixel-to-pixel -pixel or direct, whatever the terminology is on your make and model it will give you one-to-one -one pixel mapping. So that means the entire image is the entire image. It's not blowing anything up. It's not expanding anything. If you have a 4.3 image, it will you know, come up correctly on your screen here. And that's the one you want to use. Like I said, we'll get to that a little bit later down in the calibration, maybe in this video, maybe in the next one, we'll see. One of the big ones that's going to play slightly with your brightness and your contrast settings is going to be gamma. Now, every projector, every TV, and every space that those projectors or TVs and everything are sitting in will be will kind of dictate, I guess, what gamma you want to use. Because my room here, and for my settings and just the way this D Vision looks best in terms of picture quality. A 2.8 gamma looks the best, but most home theater projectors and TVs, which on this screen, I'm going back and forth, you really, you can't see all that much. Uh, you might see slight uh, kind of differences in maybe the gray here, or you may see a little bit of highlighting kind of changing on the uh, lettering there. 
but most home theaters and kind of the standard that most people put out there is going to be a 2.2 gamma. And I actually think for what we're going to do today, we're going to leave it on 2.2. Although I find in my home theater, a 2.8 kind of works better. Uh, it helps just with the contrast ratio a little bit. Uh, the way gamma works, that's basically kind of like, again, I don't have uh, the actual technical terminology in my head here, but I'll probably throw the definition of, you know, gamma in here like I did some of the other terms in my previous video. But more or less, gamma is the curve of brightness of how your white levels kind of go from black to white. You know, how quickly does it move from black to white? more or less is the way I've always looked at it. And depending how dark your space is and the kind of content you watch, sometimes a higher gamma, which would be, it sounds weird, it's lower on the scale. So 2.2, 2.0, 1 1.8, stuff like that. Those are higher gammas. It's gonna give you more highlighting and, and brighten the image. Those are usually better for like sports, and rooms that don't have complete light control. So if you have ambient light or you can't control your lighting, you know, in the space, you sometimes will want a higher gamma to kind of help uh, keep the image. It makes it look better in that space. The lower gammas, when you get to 2.4, 2.6, 2.8, you know, even maybe some that are even more extreme than that, although I've never really seen one go past 2.8 in any projector that I've owned. On those gamma settings, those are darker gamma settings. And so the black to white kind of curve is a lot longer. So it goes, it takes a lot longer to get from black to white on the gamma curve. And those are really more suited for home theaters and spaces that have total light control where you can completely black the room out and control the light 100% and you can have an, a, a completely dark space. And in situations like that, like I found here with this projector and my space, that 2.8 gamma to my eye from just watching content and doing some like demo stuff, that 2.8 gamma to me looks better. Now it's all subjective. And there are some rules saying, oh, you should only do 2.2 or you should only do 2.4 or whatever. You'll see a lot of conjecture about it online. Ultimately, for me, yes, there is more of a rule in place, I guess, to be a 2.2 gamma. But to me, as with a lot of these settings and a lot of just home theater topics in general, do what you like. So kind of calibrate your TV. And like in with this projector, it's nice. You can actually go to this profile section and create multiple profiles. So you could go in and create a 2.2 and a 2.8 or a 2.2 and a 2.4, you know, gamma, and then go through and watch some content and switch between them and see what you like the best. Uh, but anyways, that's just my little rant about that. But here today for what we're going to do, we're going to stick with 2.2. And those are settings, like I said, especially your gamma, you want to kind of set that and try and decide what you want before you start getting into changing your brightness and contrast, because gamma, brightness, and contrast are all going to play with each other. And so you could set your gamma to one setting, change your brightness and contrast, and then if you go back and change your gamma to something else, your brightness and contrast are going to be off. You know, theoretically, that shouldn't be the case, but that's normally what you see. So decide on that. So for today, for the purposes of this video, and I'm going to store a new profile with all these settings, a 2.2 gamma is what we're going to go with here. A couple of the other settings you may run into on newer TVs, newer projectors that my projectors here don't have because they're not 4K and they're not like newer, just stuff, you know, out in the marketplace. Sometimes on gamma and like color spaces and stuff, you're going to see like BT 2020, like BT 1880 or something like that. You're going to see SDR versus HDR gamma and contrast and different things in there. When you're getting into a lot of that stuff, uh, I am not that well versed in what you want to use in that 
sort of situation because I've always stuck with standard 1080 projectors and I've never really had any that had 4K, you know, color spaces, 4K gamma settings and all this sort of stuff. So you definitely want to make sure you maybe look into that and read the user manuals and maybe troll some forums, you know, and see what's out there if you're getting into that. For what we're doing today, we're doing just a standard kind of Rec. 709, 1080p, just your basic calibration you would see on like majority of home theater projectors that are not 4K or that are 4K that aren't using high dynamic range, that are just using 1080p, let's say. So Gamma 2.2, your color max, this is a brilliant color color setting. A lot of this is going to vary by your projector model and the the options and the names terminology and how in depth you can get with changing this is really going to change uh depending on what make and model of projector you have uh for me and for this projector since this is an extremely high end projector for its time uh this one was about $15,000 when it came out this one isn't really made for dedicated home theaters this is a venue projector made for venues situations so you can go in and change the color spaces which is what brilliant color is from computer to video which if you've noticed you could probably pick it up on the camera computer native is a lot brighter and a little bit cooler than what video native is that's a little bit uh, dimmer and a little bit more warm on it off completely which kind of dulls it out just completely on there and then computer balanced and video balanced are uh kind of like clipped versions that are technically i think video balanced is what we should use for a situation like this for home theater uh, honestly though from again kind of just playing around and looking at different content and everything i really like computer native uh, i think that looks the best for the situation and I've also gone in and changed the color temperature. So for this situation with Rec. 709, 6500K, which stands for Kelvins, but 6500 is the standardized white balance for Rec. 709 and pretty much the bulk of your home theater viewing and projectors are going to be at 6500. And basically what this temperature is, again, in layman's terms, is the color of white. How cool or how warm is the white level uh, in your image? 6500 is kind of like just the dedicated, I wouldn't say middle point, but that's kind of the dedicated point for video content. And if I play with this, if I go down, like down here, which you will probably see it hopefully on the camera, like this is really warm when you get down into the 400s the white looks like almost like a sepia tone you know kind of pinkish almost and then if you go way up into like the 7 800s 900s this should look really blue like you can tell this looks way bluer and hopefully my camera's picking this up but in person you can tell this is really like blue on here uh so for this we want to stick at 6500 now if you're Using a more modern TV or maybe even a more low budget projector, I guess, or even just certain brands of projectors, you may not see actual numbers here. You may just see settings that say natural or normal, cool, warm, theater, cinema, sports. You may see a lot of those settings. And what you want to do, again, is without having professional equipment to actually meter and read all these settings you want to find the one that looks kind of like this image here and a good kind of test to do this or a little way to kind of go about doing this and i actually picked this up off of someone who left a comment i believe on one of my videos or it may have been in a forum uh, if i can find the comment i i may throw the screenshot of the comment in here but a good little tip that I found, which really does seem to work, if you take, especially on an iPhone, I'm not 100% sure about Android phones, but iPhones, for the most part, have a calibrated uh, screen on them, so long as you don't have uh, night mode on or 
any sort of like image enhancement in the settings, if you just have it as a standard uh, display image coming up, you can take a picture of a grayscale, which we'll get to here in a little bit, and hold that up next to your screen, and then basically go through your color settings, you know, either the numbers 6500 or whatever, or your cool, warm, natural, whatever, theater, cinema, and scroll through those with your phone against the screen until you see the one that looks most like that image on your phone. Because that phone is pretty much calibrated to Rec. 709. So if you find a color setting that way that matches, set it there and leave it as, at that. Because that's going to be pretty close. Like over 90% close enough to what we're trying to do. And all these settings here and everything we're doing today, I've mentioned this before. I am not an expert. I'm just a guy who has been into this hobby for a number of years and played around with projectors and stuff here on my free time. So if you want it to get like perfectly dialed in like to a T, at that point you're going to have to go out and either buy actual equipment and, you know, do everything that way with actual metered calibrated equipment or go and pay for an actual ISF calibrator or somebody to come in and do it with their equipment. If you're really wanting to get like that, like sharp, you know, to a T on it. Uh, if you're just wanting to get like, I don't know, 80%, 90% there with everything, you can do that here at home. You know, it may not be by the book perfect, but I think it's going to drastically increase your enjoyability and the picture quality of what you're seeing. So anyway, so we talked about, you know, just some random settings on there. Another setting, which unfortunately my uh, Logitech remote and the remote I have for this projector doesn't have a setting on it. I would have to go physically press it on the back. But another setting that's going to play a little bit with your contrast, your brightness, and even your gamma slightly is going to be an iris setting. And an iris is basically like it is on a camera or anything else on a projector is, is just a way to constrict the amount of light that's coming out. And this projector I have set up right now, this D-Vision, I'm running this in single lamp mode. So I only have a single lamp running, not dual lamp. And I have the lamp toned down a little bit, which I'll actually show you real quick because I can show you on this one. On here, uh, installation, go down to lamp. Do, do, do. I have them set each lamp to uh, six power. They go on a scale of one to eight. So this is like 75%. Uh, but if you look, I have it on an auto switch mode. So what that means is it's going to start with one lamp, play it for 10 hours, and then once it hits 10 hours, it's going to transition over to the other lamp. And that way I can alternate. And that should, in theory, allow me about double the time out of these lamps that I have here. But one thing you want to play with in terms of lamp power and your iris settings is that the iris is going to constrict the amount of light that comes out. So it's going to dim the image on there. Uh, the other setting that's going to change with that is your lamp setting. So setting your lamp to normal mode, uh, which again, not every projector is going to have this level of customi customization on there. But setting it to normal or setting it to like an eco mode, that's also going to raise or lower the amount of light output that comes out. Uh, also coupled with if you have an iris setting, how dim the image is going to be, or, you know, just on the screen without any adjustment. That's also going to play a little bit with your settings, because if you have your settings set to be much lower and then you kick the brightness up or you open the iris up, it is going to change what you see on the screen. Again, in a perfect world and in theory, your brightness and your gamma and your contrast theoretically should not change depending on what lamp setting you have, what iris setting you have, stuff like that. But it will. Uh, honestly, it will. I, I mean, maybe if you get up into like super, super high end, I'm talking like actual theater level quality projectors, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, stuff like that, maybe it won't. Or if you have some real high end like laser projectors or something, maybe it won't. But at least in my experience, for all the projectors I've owned, 
this D Vision, my Knoll LED, my Marantz, any of those, my older JVCs and Epsons I used to have, every one of them would still change depending on the lamp setting and the iris setting if there's an iris on your model. Going along with that, one other thing before we hop in, and I know I'm rambling here, a dynamic iris or a dynamic dimming setting is also going to play heavily into your calibration. If you want to use those settings, because there are some benefits if you have a model of a projector that actually has a functional version of a dynamic iris or dynamic dimming, which my null LED has dynamic dimming, but it does not work, it's terrible. And this D-Vision does not have a dynamic iris, it only has a manual iris. But if you have those settings and you want to use them, turn them off completely when you go in to do your calibration. Do all your calibrating with contrast, you know, gamma, brightness, anything you want to do like that. And then go in, watch some demo content, see how you like the image. And if you decide you want to put on a dynamic iris setting or a dynamic dimming if it works, then do it after you've done the calibration. Because when you try and go in and calibrate, especially the brightness setting, which basically is calibrating the black floor of the image, if you have those settings enabled, it's going to cause just havoc on you trying to get the actual settings set up properly because the image is going to constantly like pulse back and forth of brightening up and dimming down with those settings enabled. So keep all those off while you're calibrating. And then ultimately, if you decide you want to use them, do it after you've calibrated everything. And then maybe you might have to go in and nudge up brightness by like one or a contrast setting by like one or two but do all your calibration first before you enact any of those features because it's going to just cause problems trying to calibrate so with that being said i think i've rambled if i think of anything else while we're actually doing this uh, i'll obviously chime in so i'm going to back up just a little bit so we can see here we're going to go up and we're going to start with the basic settings and like I said, when I click on this, it's going to first go into the brightness setting. And when that comes up on where my camera and everything's seated right now, it's probably not going to look like much of anything. It's probably going to be a, a gray or a black screen. But that's where we're going to go first. And I'm going to cut in with some footage from my camera kind of held up, you know, close enough to the screen that you can see it. So here we go. We're going to click just the basic settings on here probably take a second but we're going to do that and yeah so now it's coming up and like i said here you go you, you can probably see some of the text but i can almost guarantee you can't see the black bars that are flashing uh so i'm also going to turn off the lights alexa turn off the theater room lights alexa turn off the theater room lights and again, you probably can't see anything here. I'm going to hop in with the other footage here in just a second. And we'll kind of talk over this and everything as we go in here. Okay, so here we are. Now, like I said, this footage is probably not going to look the greatest. And I'm trying to get in there. I don't even know. The ISO and everything's maxed out, so I don't know if you can even really see it. But ideally, what we're trying to do here with the brightness setting is we're setting the black floor and you'll see a pattern like this uh, obviously on this avs hd disc but also if you use the spears and munsell digital video essentials disney wow any of the thx certified discs whatever they're going to have similar patterns may not be exactly the same but they're going to look pretty similar to this and ideally what you're trying to do is get the reference black which is bar number 16 right here as i kind of come up number 16 right here that says reference black you want that to fade into the background and everything below that fade into the background and have it be black and not see any blinking bars of gray in it and what you're going to do is raise and lower the settings until you see just barely see 17 
18, 19, and so on, how it is with increasing levels of like a flashing gray bar. So what I'm going to do, I've got to find where my remote is and try and do this both, both handed here, two handed. We're going to bring up the brightness setting, which most brightness is going to be set at like 50 on here. I'm going to just raise and lower a little bit here, but yeah, it should be like set at 50. You may not be able to see it because of the ISO settings. But what we want to do is go up and down until the number 16 starts to flash. So I'm going to like pull this way up. All right. You really can't see it flashing here, but this is way blown out. Um, but you can see the bars flashing. So what we're going to do is go back to brightness and we're going to start to bring this down until number 17 just starts to flash, but everything else looks black below it. And I hate how like limited these menus are. They just stay up. So for me, I think kind of rocking it back and forth. And of course, this camera footage is going to be a little bit different than seeing it in person. We could go 52 or 51. And when you get to something like this, 51, it, it depends what you want. So 52 is probably going to give you a little bit better dark, like shadow detail, you know, and a little more, uh, you know, kind of like elevated black level, but you're going to see more shadow detail and stuff like that. Where at 51, you can still see some shadow detail, but the blacks are going to be a little bit darker and the shadow detail is going to be a little bit uh, reduced. So what I think we're going to do, I think we're going to stick it at 51 on here. And again, essentially what you're wanting to do is just find where you want the setting. But ideally, as I get a little bit closer on this one, you really want to see just a faint kind of bar popping up in number 17. And like I said, you could raise it one more and have a little bit more there if, if you want to see just a little more shadow detail. Uh, but you are going to sacrifice the black level a little bit. So you got to play with what you want and kind of decide, uh, you know, how you want to do it. So what we're going to see now on this image here, this is just a dual. Uh, you have your contrast on the top and bottom and then your uh brightness level here in the middle. Uh, I never really use this one. I usually just use the like contrast screen and the brightness screen. So we're going to just move on to the next one here real quick. Oh, I got to switch back over to my Blu-ray player. That's the one problem using a universal remote. You've got to constantly swap back and forth. Okay, so now we're on to contrast. Contrast is a little bit different. So brightness is basically doing your handling your black level. So the lowest point in the image and then kind of shadow details kind of coming out of out of the lowest point. With that, generally speaking, you want a hard stop at bar 16, which is considered the reference black level. Uh, anything below that you really want to fade away. You don't really want to elevate it so much that you start seeing beyond that because that's going to wash the image out. Now on the flip side, there's two trains of thought, schools of thought on contrast, which is basically your white level. You could set it as this uh, pattern here says as I walk around. You can set it to reference white, which is 235. There is a bar here. You can't see it with the settings right now, but as we start changing them, you'll see it. But it's this bar here, and if you see here, this says set level so that 230 to 234 flash. So it would just be this little limited bar here. So it's kind of the inverse of the uh, brightness setting for the black level. So you have a handful of bars there and then a handful of bars here. One school of thought is you just set it right here for these four or five kind of spaces. Other people will say, go in and kind of turn your settings down until you have a decently bright image so that it's not completely dulled out. 
But if you see things past the reference level, that's okay. You know, you're just going to see more details saying like snow or clouds or stuff like that. I kind of fall kind of in between and I sort of, sort of say like, do again, what is your preference? What kind of looks the best to your eyes when you're watching content, but also see what the limitations are of your projector. Because here, when I go into contrast, again, we're at 50. If I raise this up a lot, it just whites every, it blocks everything out. You can't see any uh, deviation at all in the white levels. But So you got to kind of bring it down. The problem is, though, when you start getting down too low, the image is doled out. But if you notice, these bars here never change. You're not seeing anything past this, even being down into like the 30s on the contrast. So for this projector and what I have here, we're really just sticking to the reference level upward. So what I want to do is make it as bright as I can until bar 234 dis disappears. And this, again, will, will vary by TV and projector. You may have a little more, you know, play with this. But we're just going to keep going until, so at 50, that bar disappears. So really, 49 gives you, you can just faintly see, you may not be able to see it on the camera, but here in real life, you can just faintly make out 234, then 233 shows up, 232, 231, 230. And reference white is still, you know, just whited out and then everything past that. But again, you want to use your preference and what your projector or TV is capable of reproducing. Because not every projector will be able to give you expanded white uh, down, down the line. For example, just kind of talking about that, my null LED projector can reproduce uh, above reference like white through pretty much almost every one down to like 252 or 253. And you can do that without limiting the uh, white level, the contrast level too much. You know, like you got to bring it down a little bit, but you're not bringing it down so much that the image is completely like washed out and like faded into just like a muted gray color, you can still get some peak white content while still maintaining that high level of, you know, visibility. But this division doesn't do that. So again, your preference, whatever looks best to you and do what your machine, your projector, your TV, your equipment is able to reproduce. And so in this case, we're only reproducing this kind of level right here, where some other units like my null LED or some JVCs, Epson, Sony's, whatever, other TVs, you know, may be able to go down the line further. Just do your preference and what you're really wanting, you know, to see and what really is appealing to you. So now we're going to go here to the next image. If I remember correctly, is this the grayscale? Well, this is color. So... We'll talk about this real quick, too. Why not? We'll throw that in here. Uh, this is color reproduction. Now, on most projectors that I've seen, you can kind of go in and play with this even on an HDMI setting. However, for this video and this projector here, if you are using an HDMI input, color and hue are kind of blacked out. You can't go in and change it. And so color and hue are basically matching up uh, the colors. Now, this kind of pattern here to the naked eye doesn't mean much. Uh, we can't do much here. What you need is a blue filter. And so a blue filter is either going to be built into the projector. So like my null LED has a blue filter built in. You can go in and actually turn it on and it'll basically just light up the blue LED and create an entirely blue image. And then you can go in there and change hue and tint to make sure the entire image, all these flashing boxes, look uniform so that you don't see any flashing. It just looks like one solid blue image uh, across the uh, screen. Some projectors have that. Like I said, my null LED, and to be honest, out of all the projectors I've owned in my life, the null LED is the only one that allows you to pull up a, a completely blue image internally. Everything else, you would need a blue color filter to actually use to do this. Now, some of them give you little test strips. Uh, the Disney Wow Disc gives you a little blue test strip on just like a little cardboard thing you hold up to your eye. 
Uh, you can also get one that looks like a film strip. I have just a very generic bare bones uh, calibration disc that has it looks just like a film strip with blue tint to it. Or you can find glasses, and I have a pair of uh, THX certified blue glasses that you could wear as well that will let you adjust the color. And it's really hard to reproduce here on the camera, but essentially, like I said, what you're doing is hue and tint change and manipulate the saturation and like the color, whether it's a little more green, a little more red. And ultimately when you're doing that, you wanna make sure all these flashing boxes disappear and everything just looks blue across the image. And it may take a little playing with, you know, but most of the time you're only adjusting like one or two clicks in either direction. I've never had a projector where I've had to go more than like two clicks to the left or right, you know, into the green or into the red or, you know, to the positive or negative on saturation and color to actually get the image to look correct. And most of them, to be honest, like my null LED is perfectly fine with an HDMI input as is you don't have to change anything uh, now when i use the blue color filter on this i wear my thx glasses let's say this one is off slightly and if you remember like 10 15 minutes ago when i talked about the color uh space that i use on this i use computer native part of the reason i do that is when i pull this pattern up since i can't adjust the color intent with an hdmi input on this the computer native color space creates the least amount of an error on the screen. Things look the closest to being solidly blended with my blue glasses on a computer native color space where everything else uh, just looks worse. And so that's another reason why I use computer native for my color space on this pattern. And I'm going to look, where are we? We're at like 40 minutes. Let's hop into the next image. I think this is going to be like sharpness and everything. We may just kind of knock out the rest of this stuff here. We'll see. Okay, so this is your overscan and your sharpness and focus. So a good rule of thumb, and I think I mentioned this in my last video, when you square the image and when you're doing a lot of this stuff, your sharpness, your focus, that stuff can be fine-tuned a little bit later on. You don't really have to do all that up front. Uh, and really, that's kind of the last thing you want to do. Now, mine is already kind of set up for my space. And you will notice there is a slight overscan on all four sides. And the reason I do that is because the way my screen is constructed, since I did a DIY kind of screen image, you may be able to tell kind of over here, the way I kind of stapled and cut the fabric is kind of rough. It's not a clean kind of cut along the edges. There's some, even up here, you might be able to see very slightly some frayed like edges. So in order to hide that, I expand the image out a little bit so that it overspills slightly and you don't see kind of right on the cusp of the image, all these kind of like frayed edges of the material that's kind of stapled in there. But really what you want to do here for focus and all this sort of stuff, you want to start with your overscan. And ideally in here, I'll go in and actually change it slightly and then put it back. On here, I've got to find the option. Uh, if you zoom way down, you'll see it is way, way out of the borders. You may or may not be able to see for this, we can turn the lights on. You may be able to see like, this is really like cropped in here. Uh, you know, you're missing like several, you know, a couple inches on each side of the image. And so what you want to do is get it, ideally, this white border of the screen right to the edge of your projector screen. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to click zoom up and keep zooming, keep zooming. A little bit more. So there's that. The other thing you might have to do is uh, go into shift uh, and kind of move it down. Now, my projector here has powered options. Now, not every projector is going to have that. Uh, some are going to have manual 
uh, features like this. So you're going to have to physically move it either with an Allen key or some knobs or whatever. But ideally what you're trying to do is kind of like this is get everything in there as closely as possible to fill the screen without, you know, kind of like spilling over outside. And if you look, this one's pretty good. Again, my screen is not completely, uh, cut properly with the material and everything. So mine, I usually spill over, but ideally this is kind of what you want is something like that. But I'm going to go back, uh, out to where it was and kind of just spill it over slightly and then kind of shift it back up a little bit. And ideally with like shift and everything, you want to do this with a, uh, checkerboard pattern you know or just like a the shift pattern uh not just the regular image to make sure it's correct but there's that and then the other thing you want to do is focus and sharpness kind of a rule of thumb for me sharpness i don't really mess with sharpness i usually leave it at zero because if you turn it way up you may not be able to see on the camera but all these kind of lines right here along this become jagged and out of focus. So I generally will bring this down to zero and that will usually smooth everything out. And you won't see any like haloing or other artifacts kind of brought up over say the lettering that's here. You know, you can see some haloing if you get up close to it. You'll see just weird kind of uh, images coming up around like text and everything. So I generally leave that at zero. Uh, some projectors and TVs, if you set it, say it's on a scale of like 50 in the middle and then negative and positive, usually 50 is where you want to keep it. Because if you go into the negative, it'll blur the image uh, like way too much that you won't be able to actually like see anything. All right. So where was I? So yeah, so sharpness, keep it zero. Uh, at least in my opinion, you might be able to add like one or two or something on there to sharpen it up a little bit. But ideally, you want to keep that as close to zero as possible while maintaining an image that doesn't become so soft and blurred that you can't see it because any, you know, like artificial sharpening that you're applying in there is just going to uh, just cause issues with the image. You want to try and keep it as clean as possible. So now we're going to also go into focus. So once you zoom and shift your image out and get it centered and kind of zoomed out correctly and proportionate to your screen, you want to then go into focus. And so for this, it all depends on how you want to do this. You can use a pattern like this. I also enjoy pulling up just like a menu or something on the screen that's kind of centered or is around so you can kind of look. But ideally what you want to do is go into your focus. Again, you might have powered settings or you may have to physically go up and just turn the lens. But go in and just take your focus and just blur it way out. To where you can't see anything and then hit the opposite way so if you you know go in uh you know now go out if you go out then go in but bring it back to where it starts to look you know clear and sharp and then just keep doing it until it goes out the other way and now you can see it's blurry the other way then go back and you just want to rock back and forth until, like this, you can see down there it looks clear. Up here it looks clear. Everything looks sharp. You don't see any, uh, you know, like haloing. You don't see any kind of blurred out areas. And you can kind of just like keep going back and forth again. There we go. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, there we go. We're good. So yeah, so, and then kind of step back and look, everything should look sharp. And there is another kind of tip you can do with this. Uh, admittedly, I don't have a regular printer here, so I don't have any regular printer paper, but you could take a piece of plain white printer paper and hold it up to the screen in various spots to make sure the focus looks good. But Ultimately, that's what you want to do. You want to kind of get it to where 
everything looks sharp. Nothing looks blurry. The entire image uh, looks good because some projectors, depending how low or down in quality they are or, or potentially how old they are. Uh, so like my planar projector that I've used, uh, I had a video on it. I'll link that up here. That one's pretty old and it was a, a decent amount of money when it came out, but it's a lot lower quality than these other projectors I've owned. That one, when you kind of rock the focus in and out and the zoom and all that sort of stuff, you can't get a completely uniform image. Uh, every part of the image kind of has its own focus point. And so inevitably something is going to be kind of blurry. So your idea with something like that typically is try and get to a point where the majority of the image looks good. And if you have one spot that's kind of out of focus, do the best you can to get that in focus. But sometimes that's a limitation of the actual projector that you're using. Uh, now, for for this sort of stuff, the focus, the zoom, that obviously doesn't apply to a TV, uh, but sharpness does. So you still want to make sure your sharpness kind of sits right in that sweet spot of everything looks sharp, but you don't see haloing or other artifacts coming in around objects on the screen. So ultimately now, I think we're pretty good with all this sort of stuff outside of us doing the color and tint here, which if you click on this uh, kind of disc, if you download it and go to the actual HD TV calibration they have on this disc, they will talk about that and show some examples. Uh, but now I think we're pretty much to the end of doing everything here. I'm going to look and see if there's anything else that pops up. But I think we're probably, I think this might bring us back here. Yeah, so the only other thing I would talk about, and on this disk or this kind of file, if you download it to a uh, USB or something, if you go to MISC patterns, so the miscellaneous, in terms of talking about grayscale, one kind of pattern that is good if you go to additional is go to the grayscale, st grayscale steps, if I could talk whenever this comes up, which I think is the second option on here. This first one's just a blended pattern from black to white, uh, which is nice, but uh, doesn't really do much for what we're wanting to do here. But the next uh, pattern that comes up on here, this is your grayscale pattern. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier in the video. If you can get your actual cell phone so like i you know have an actual iphone in my personal life that i use and then the samsung is just for my uh you know video making here on youtube but if you pull up a grayscale pattern and pull this up on your phone and sit it up here you could really match your color temperature settings to this grayscale pattern and get it as close as you can to it to where everything looks it kind of like a neutral gray. The gray doesn't look uh, reddish and it doesn't look bluish or greenish. It just looks like a standard gray. And like I said, you can just find just a generic grayscale pattern on online, pull it up and then just hold it up here, you know, into your eye and just look and try and match it. And this would be a good pattern to, to use for something like that. So anyways, I think that pretty much about covers everything here for this video. Uh, this will probably conclude the nuts and bolts of doing the calibration stuff. Uh, so three videos, I think it'll kind of work out like that. I may do one final follow-up video. If there's any questions that people have, you can leave them down in the comments and I'll try and answer some of that. But for today, for this, I think we've probably reached a good kind of point. Uh, with this, when you get through all these settings, so I'll actually do that real quick as well. Some projectors like this one that I have here, my D-Vision, will let you save a profile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store this into uh, Profile 9 because I haven't used that yet. And it'll be saved. So now these settings are saved in here. So if I want to change anything, I can always go back and pull this one up you know, to use. And some projectors will let you set it like this. Other ones will have you just set it via the profile. So sometimes they'll have user profiles or uh, your cinema, your theater, natural setting, like profiles you can manipulate a little bit. 
Uh, but I definitely recommend do a user setting, save it in there. And then again, if you want to go back, change the gamma, change some stuff up, save it as another user setting. And then you can A, B it back and forth and watch some demo content and just see what you like and what you think looks the best. So anyways, that's enough rambling. I think we're probably about an hour or so on this video. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone like I always do. If you have questions about anything, feel free to leave me some comments down below uh, with your questions about this stuff. I'll maybe do a follow-up video kind of talking about this uh, with questions and a wrap-up thing. But yeah, so with that, I will see you next time in the next video here on Secondhand Home Theater. Uh, I appreciate everyone who's watched, and I will see you next time. Thank you.